So briefly, I want to qualify myself, and then I'll get into the presentation. Uh, I was addicted to more, whatever it was that anybody had around me. I wanted more of it. Uh, usually, though, if, if, if there was crack cocaine nearby, that was my drug of choice. So I would, I would chase the crack cocaine and alcohol and marijuana. I did just about every drug under the sun. Um, didn't get into in, any intravenous use, uh, but dabbled in a lot of different drugs and eventually came to a head and went to uh, Valley Hope for treatment in 2004 and didn't follow all the suggestions that the professionals had. I tried to do it on my own, tried to cut corners. I thought I was smarter than everybody and that didn't work out so well. So I, I relapsed and had a use recurrence and, and it got worse than before. So I went back to treatment in 06 and I don't know, I had an aha moment, uh, spiritual experience, light bulb went on what, you know, there's everybody calls it something different, but I decided I was going to do what, whatever it took. And, and so I spent the first year living with my grandmother in North, North central Oklahoma, and then eventually moved into an Oxford house because I, I'd never lived on my own. I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to adult. I didn't know how to grocery shop. I didn't know how to pay bills on time. I didn't really know how to take care of myself as most adults do that were in their late twenties. So Oxford house taught me a lot of that. I moved into an Oxford house, lived with other men in recovery. We did it together. We learned things together. And eventually I wanted to pay that forward to people coming after me. So I applied and got hired to be an outreach worker, worked in Oklahoma, opened about 30 plus houses there, then transferred to Texas, opened some houses in Texas. And now uh, living and working in Texas also helped with some other states. So I have uh, opened many women's and women and children's houses and been able to um, help with the structure and support within uh, the, the house environment uh, for Oxford House. Uh, there is women coming in that are pregnant. There's women coming in who have completely lost custody of their children or signed over their rights that have no uh, communication with their children. There are some where the state has custody. They're trying to get their children back. So they're supervised visitation. And then there's some women coming in who already have full custody of their children and need a safe place to recover an early recovery that have their children. So there's a lot of different pathways and, and personal experiences that the women come to Oxford House. And I mean, I'm just, I'm gonna be very honest and blunt about it. We're not a, we're not a net that catches everybody. Oxford House has a really good niche in, in what we do and we do it very well, but there are situations where Oxford House is just not gonna be the best fit, that there's probably other living opportunities or options out there that are better suited for women who have uh, multiple children or older children or um, are seeking a different type of environment. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share a, uh, it's, it's not a PowerPoint, it's actually a slideshow through Canva. I've discovered Canva during the COVID restriction. I've been playing around a lot with it, using it as a presentation. So I, I enjoy doing that. I'll go through a slideshow. And as questions come up, if you wanna type them in the chat, I don't mind being interrupted to answer any questions, especially if we're on a certain topic, we can kind of stay on that topic and move on. But I will definitely open it up at the end for any comments or questions anybody has about any of the presentation material. So let me share my screen and start the slideshow. Let me get the Zoom windows out of the way. All right, Oxford House. Here's what we're going to talk about today. The start, the structure, the support, the studies, the setup, and then the websites. So Oxford House, the very first house opened in 1975 in Silver Spring, Maryland. It was a county-run halfway house where the individuals that lived there were managed. There was a manager, there was a counselor, there was a cook. I think there was even a maid or a housekeeper. So the county spent a lot of money for this halfway house that had just a few beds. And men that came in had to leave in six months to make room for new people to come in. So that wasn't a lot of time for them to become stable in their recovery. So most of them did not make it that had to leave. The county decided, well, this costs too much money. It's not working. We're, we're going to shut it down. The men didn't want to be put out. They knew that if they had to leave that house, that chances are they were not going to stay sober. So they got a little loan from a long-term member in AA, and they decided to sign a lease with the landlord and rent the home themselves. 
very quickly, they found out they could not afford the chef, the cook, they could not afford the housekeeper, they could not afford the counselor. So there's like, well, how are we going to do this? We don't, we can't afford to pay anybody to run the house. And so they decided they'll just run it themselves. So that's how the whole concept of Oxford House was born was they didn't really have enough money to pay people to do it for them. So they just did it themselves. So they rented the house, they maintained the house, everybody pitched in an equal amount to make sure all the bills got paid, the rent to the landlord, the utilities, you know, whatever uh, other house supplies they needed for common use, toilet paper, laundry, soap, uh, cleaning supplies, stuff like that. So over time, they stayed full. The reputation got around that this was actually working. People didn't think it would work, that people could live in early recovery in a house without direct supervision and it be successful, but it was. And so they saved up enough money to open another house because they had a stack of 20 plus applications for people wanting to move into that house. So they rented another house. And about a year or so later, that house saved up enough money, they rented another one. So very slowly, over about 10 years from 1975 to maybe the early mid 80s, they opened about 12 or 13 houses in the DC area, Philadelphia, Virginia area, but it was very slow and there was the need was great. So some of the people had connections through Capitol Hill and they were able to get a provision put in the Anti-Drug Abuse Act to start a revolving loan fund where states would set aside $100,000 and individuals that wanted to start an Oxford house could borrow from that $4,000 from that 100,000 revolving loan fund, get the house furnished, get the first month uh, of rent paid and utilities turned on and then pay that back over a two year period. After that happened, <clears throat> and also after the um, amendment to the Federal Fair Housing Act, which stated that people in recovery from substance use disorder were considered disabled and therefore a protected class we were able to rent homes in single family settings in neighborhoods, and we were able to get startup money to get the houses started. We didn't have to wait for an existing house to save up the money to do it. So it, it expanded rapidly throughout the United States. And today we have, I believe it's 3,100 houses, 3,100 houses. We're in 48, 49 states and over 25,000 beds. So we have men's houses, we have women's houses, we have women with children's houses, and we have men with children's houses. Those are the specific uh, gender breakdowns of the houses we currently have. So that in order to be an Oxford house, what sets it apart from traditional sober living, halfway houses, three quarter houses, recovery residences, there's a lot of different terms being used for a sober living environment. What separates Oxford house is the charter. So in order to be an Oxford House, you have to apply for and be granted a charter. And the charter states that the house will be self-governed. There's no house manager, house mother. Everybody's equal in the house. It will be self-financed. So everybody pays an equal uh, share of what it costs to operate the house. So based on membership, that can change. So in a nine person house, it may only cost $120 a week per person to get all the bills paid. But if they lose members and drop down to four or five people, they still have to bring in the whatever $3,500 a month for all the bills and utilities so that uh, amount per person would go up. And then there's a zero tolerance. So if anybody returns to active drug use or alcohol use, they are immediately expelled from membership and evicted from the house. And then also, as I said, that they're gender specific and we have to have at least six beds. So we don't want to rent a two bedroom house where only three people live. There needs to be at least six beds. So we're looking for four, five, six, seven bedroom homes with multiple bathrooms, plenty of parking. We need large homes. The larger, the better. So self-governed, what does that look like? Because that can scare a lot of people, especially in the professional field that aren't familiar with Oxford House. So to be self-governed means that they control their own membership. Nobody is, even though judges may tell somebody in drug court that they need to go live in an Oxford house or maybe a probation officer or a counselor may say you need to go live in Oxford house. They still have to be interviewed and accepted by the members in that home. So 80% acceptance rate is required for a new applicant to move into the home. So they sit down and have a formal, formal interview with that person. They wanna know just, are you serious about recovery? Will you follow the rules, play nice with others? You know, can you pay your fair share? You know, are you here for the right reasons? They wanna know, are you there for the right reasons? Because we're not a flop house, we're not a shelter. Like there's a lot of different um, 
motivations for people to come into Oshawa House, but we want to make sure it's recovery motivated. Uh, they elect officers within the house. So it's like a mini board meeting once a week. They have a weekly business meeting where you have a president, a secretary, a treasurer, a comptroller, a chore coordinator who assigns chores. So they get together, they, they fill out forms, they go through reports, they motion, they use parliamentary procedure, and they vote on everything. They get to decide every, everything that happens in that house, they get to vote on and decide. All the money that comes in that's extra and left over, there's no dues. Like that myself and other staff, we don't get any commission from that. Oxford House Incorporated does not charge any kind of membership fees. We ask for donations, but we don't require any membership fees or anything like that. All the money stays in the house. So if they have extra money, they can upgrade the television or buy new pillow top mattresses or decide what they want to do. They want to go out for a state dinner for unity night. They can do that. Uh, within the home, it, because it is democratic, that means that each person has to be responsible. So you can't come in and do nothing. You're going to have to do a chore. You're going to get elected to an house, house officer position. You're going to be expected to contribute in some way to the operation of the home. And so people coming in need to understand that, that that's important. You can't just come in, stay sober and pay a weekly amount and you'd be good. Like you have to participate. And then collectively there's accountability. So when people are not doing what they need to do, that the members of the house are expected to hold that individual accountable. If they're isolating or maybe they're backsliding, maybe they're spending too much time with a significant other than they are their sponsor. Like those are things that as when you live with somebody, you pick up on their routines and their habits. And when, the, when they change, you can address those and hold them accountable. There's only a few things that would result in, in an immediate expulsion. Uh, and that would be uh, obviously relapse, uh, violence, if fights or, or any form of violence, assault, battery, and then uh, crimes. If you have any major crimes while living in Oxford House, you're not gonna get to stay there. So what does self-finance look like? So each house has its own bank account. We get a tax ID number when we open a house, the utilities, the bank account, the lease, everything's in the house's name. Nothing's in an individual's name. So they control those funds. They get to decide what to do with it. There's a treasurer who keeps track of the money, makes deposits, writes the checks, but then there's signers in the house that aren't the treasurer. So the checks get written by one person, but signed by two others. We want two signers in the house to protect the finances. We only use checks. We don't use debit cards or any online bill pay. We want a paper trail so that signatures are required. Um, you know, if you get debit cards and all you need is a pin, you don't need really even an authorized signer. If somebody has a pin, they can use some money. That can be dangerous with people in the early recovery. I mean, I tell, I tell this story all the time in houses. I'm like, you know, I, most people will trust me now, you know, with 15 years in recovery, but when I was drinking and drugging, I was stealing from my family. Like I stole money from the people that I cared about the most. So if I'm drinking and using, you don't think that I'm going to steal from you guys who I've only known for a few months. So we have to protect the finances. Very, very important. There's a startup cost of getting the house established where we do get an initial loan. Uh, in most areas, we still have the revolving loan in place, but that's paid back so that other houses can open it. So they're is a little bit of help on the front end, but once the house is established, the house pays for everything. The, if a house does run into trouble for whatever reason, maybe they're not collecting individuals payments uh, on a consistent basis, people are getting behind with their weekly expense, maybe they have a lot of vacancies, the house can ask for a loan from the chapter, which a chapter is a collection of houses in uh, a close knit area. So like a metro area, say Austin, has I think six chapters because there's like 50 houses in Austin. So there's six chapters that the houses come together once a month and meet. And if a house is struggling, that the chapter can give them a loan. The chapter does collect dues from each of the houses to have some operating expenses and to get the support to, to help new or struggling houses. So they take care of all their bills and banking. And then we ask houses to do a prudent reserve. So we set them up, we train them, the individuals in the houses, how to set up a budget. So we know rents, a consistent number. Utilities will fluctuate based on usage or time of year. Uh, house supplies are usually pretty consistent. You're due to the chapter. If you're going to donate to Oxford House Incorporated, like, so we set them up, like, here's what it costs to run this house for one month. And then it will show if based on their membership, how much each person would pay in. But we also want to, we don't want to spend all the money each month. We want to build up a prudent reserve. So we teach the houses that we want you to set back one month surplus of whatever it costs to run your house.
And then finally, the last uh, charter requirement is zero tolerance. So what does zero tolerance look like? It just means recovery comes first. Oxford House does not own any properties. Oxford House Inc. doesn't own any properties. What we do is we rent houses from existing landlords in the community, just like any single family would. And we sign a multiple year leases and we just keep renewing leases. So we've had houses. The first house in Texas opened in 1990, Oxford House Willowick. We still rent that same property. So that's 31 years we've been renting the same house. It's about recovery. So, we're, so we want to, we don't want it to become money motivated. So there's no profit in any real sense from anybody off an Oxford house existing. The only one that really, I guess, would make any money, the landlord, I guess, because they're getting consistent rent 12 months out of the year, which you know most people who invest in rental properties account for one to two months of, of vacant property because of turnover of tenants. Well, we don't, we still pay rent because the house is leasing the Oxford house main street or whatever we're calling it is renting the, the property, not the individual. So we will have turnover in membership, but we still maintain a monthly bill uh, to, we pay our rent with that. Uh, so use recurrence would result in immediate expulsion. That's a zero tolerance. And then any significant disruptive behaviors I talked about earlier, I got a little ahead of myself earlier, uh, violent crimes or violence in the house or just threats to well-being and safety can result in immediate expulsion. Uh, but eventually, if you don't pay your fair share or you just keep breaking the house rules or you just like you're just a jerk to the people around you, eventually the people around you the, in the house will vote you out. They will just they'll get tired of you being disruptive to the well-being of the house and they will vote you out. So safety nets. So when, when I explain to people that Oxford House is self-supporting, that nobody is in charge in the houses, not even the outreach staff that are in, in many of the states, we don't run the houses, we don't have any authority in the houses, provided they're, they're following the conditions of, the, of their charter and, the, and the, the traditions found in the Oxford House manual, they can do within that protective bubble, they can make any decisions they want to, even if they're bad decisions. And sometimes accepting those bad decisions can be very tough for somebody like me. When I see a house not holding somebody accountable for paying their fair share and they get weeks behind, several hundred dollars behind and dig a very deep hole that's very difficult for them to climb out of. And then eventually maybe that person moves out and burns them for six, seven hundred dollars. I'll go over there and try to explain to them that accountability is important. You need to make sure people are current, that that's part of recovery is being responsible and paying your bills on time. So if somebody's not paying their rent to the house, their fair share, that can be a problem. There's maybe, maybe there's something going on in their recovery that is leading to this because people that are growing in recovery tend to make better decisions and are more reliable and trustworthy. So they'll, they'll pay their bills on time. Sometimes houses don't want to listen. They want to listen to the excuses that the member has. It's like, well, I have a tax return coming. And when that comes, I'll pay this much, or, you know, I'm going to go do donate plasma next week, or I got another job. I'm going to get a second job or I had to pay court fines or my tire went flat. I had to buy a new car parts. I couldn't pay this week. So everybody has something to say when they're behind and I'll go in and give them suggestions, uh, but I can't tell them what to do. I can't make them tell that person to pay or go. It's up to that house to decide that. Now, if they do that enough and don't hold people accountable to pay their bills, eventually they won't pay rent on time. And once they miss a rent payment to the landlord, then they violated one of the conditions of their charter and the chapter, which are a collection of just elected leaders within the Oxford House community or the staff, the outreach workers can come into the house and take corrective action. So we're not going to allow a group of people that are renting the home to destroy the home and to where we have to close the doors. We won't let that happen. We're gonna come in and try to uh, prevent that from happening. But the safety nets are there. You have the manual, the Oxford House manual and the traditions. There's nine traditions to Oxford House. If you go through the manual, you can see those. Very similar to AA's traditions. There's chapters and associations. So the houses belong collectively to a chapter. And then the chapters come together to form an association. So we have a South Regional Association in Texas and a North Regional Association. So the chapters every other month come together and check in with each other to make sure we're all doing well. Then you have alumni. And the community at large, the recovery community at large. So the alumni are people that have left on good terms but stay involved. They have a wealth of knowledge. They can help give back and help houses. And then you have the recovery community where 
you have people living in houses who have sponsors or grand sponsors. They have home groups. So those people learn about Oxford House. They end up coming and hanging out at the Oxford House, spending time with other people in recovery. And if they see something off, a lot of times they will kind of be a whistleblower and let us know if something's going on. And then you have the outreach, the staff with Oxford House, and then the central office, which we have our website. We have a legal team that defends our right to rent homes and single family under the Federal Fair Housing Act. Uh, we also have support from a vacancy website, from IT department to help with that. So there's a lot of support, a lot of safety nets around the houses to help teach them and train them how to operate in accordance with the traditions and the charter. So Oxford House, because it's been around for so long and it's grown and it's been very successful, there's been a lot of data to show our success. It's considered time-tested and evidence-based. So it's one of those recovery homes, one of those programs that you can refer clients to and know that you're sending them to an evidence-based program to practice. This was a quote from the U.S. Surgeon General in 2016 when he put out that uh, big piece on recovery. He said, Oxford House is a, a leading example of re recovery supportive housing. And then there's been a lot of studies and research. So there's been you know, this whole anonymity principle of 12-step uh, communities. It's been very difficult for uh, universities and other uh, agencies and organizations to truly study, uh, do some deep dives and study uh, recovery and successes in recovery. But Oxford House, because we're not affiliated with AA or NA or 12-step communities, we do, we do recommend that people living in houses get involved in those communities because you just you can plug yourself in to supportive people and supportive groups from day one. So we're very supportive of 12-step recovery and many pathways of recovery, but we're not affiliated with them. So we've allowed DePaul University and even some other universities to study Oxford House. DePaul's done, I don't know how many peer reviewed articles they've published on Oxford House, but there's a lot. If you go to our website, oxfordhouse.org, you can see some of the success there where there's been um, many documented, from, especially from the early 90s, they did some very large studies to show that there's an over 80% success rate in long-term recovery of two or more years for somebody who lives in an auction house at least a year. And then we were listed on the National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices, which I think SAMHSA has frozen that. I don't, I don't know what they're doing with um, their evidence-based programs and practices. I haven't heard anything lately, but we were on that list when it was active. And then we have local reports that we do. So it, for instance, in Texas, we're, we're contracted with um, HHSC. So we provide data to them and deliverables to them to show that we're expanding with integrity and that there's recovery happening in the houses. So we have local data uh, statistics that we can share. And then there's annual reports. So our annual report is on the national website. You can go and see how all, all the money that's collected from the state contracts gets put into uh, hiring staff to expand the concept of Oxford House, physical homes being opened and teaching the model of Oxford House. So it, you can see where all of the money goes uh, that comes from the different states. So at the, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is we're trying to give people a safe place to live and we want people to have a home. It's about having a home. There's a big difference when I sit down in house meetings between somebody saying I stay at an Oxford house or I live in an Oxford house. Uh, if, if you live there and that's your home and you're proud of it and it's a nice house and you, you want to show it off to your family and you, you, know, you want to stick around because it's a supportive environment, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create those supportive environments. So we're interested in expansion with integrity. We're not just we're not trying to throw up as many empty beds or as many houses wherever we can. We want to open houses where there's a need, but we want to do it the right way. We want to do it with integrity. We want to put quality first instead of quantity, because if we don't have the quality homes, it doesn't matter how many beds we have. People are not recovering at the, at the rate and success that we, we want to see that we're used to seeing. So when we look for a house to open- a We house have a question to, from the audience. Okay. So uh, the question is, why is the house payment weekly instead of monthly? Okay, so it's a good question. So uh, as individuals are not on a lease, individuals are voted in uh, to membership uh, to Oxford House Main Street. And with that membership comes, they get to stay at the house. So because they're not on a lease, because they're not in a landlord-tenant relationship, payment is weekly because 
of the threat of expulsion or people departing. So people come and people go. If we did it monthly, individuals would have to come with the first month. And we're trying to teach people how to um, pay bills responsibly and on time. And the concept of if everybody paid on the first, you can't spend all of that money on the first, that that money has to last the entire month. So we only do a week at a time so that we don't run into problems of somebody paying a month ahead and leaving on the seventh. And now we have to pay them three and a half weeks worth of rent back. And maybe they don't have it. Maybe they've spent that on bills. Maybe they're not, they haven't adjusted for uh, that money that isn't even earmarked for that time period yet. So we want people paying weekly because of the transitional nature of the house. It makes it easier for the finances in the house. Is that the only question so far? Yes. Okay. So when we uh, when we open houses, when we look, well, we have another new... question. Sorry. Okay. No, it's fine. <laughs> Go ahead. Since we're broke, since we're taking a break here. So um, this one is: Are the homes female and male in one house? Are there Oxford homes for women with children? Also, do you have homes in Montgomery County? Those are okay. three questions. First question: uh, No, they're gender specific. Early on, they tried. Well, they didn't try a co-ed house. What they tried was they tried to open a women's house, but they didn't have any women in the area to start it. So they put men in initially with the experience of how Oxford House works. And they would stay in separate rooms and they would fill the house with women. And eventually as the, as the house filled with women, the men would move out. Well, they found out that the women and men uh, were losing um, focus on recovery and they were focused on other things like relationships, uh, unhealthy relationships. So it became there some tension in the house because one girl and one guy were not just seeing each other. They were also seeing other people in the house and became a, it became a big problem. So we don't have any co-ed houses. We found out very early on that recovery takes a back seat. And when men have issues in the house with each other or women have issues in the house with personality conflicts or, or behavior, it's much easier for them to discuss it together as women or together as men versus if you have men and women together. So we're very gender specific. We do have homes for women and children. It, I, know the, I know the purpose of this presentation is for, um, for women. And I wanna get to, I wanna cover the basics of Oxford House so you know kind of where we're coming from and, and how we're structured. And then I'll get into specifics on how the women and children houses operate because they do have some differences from the normal houses. And then Montgomery County, um, I'm not familiar with all of the counties and where all of the houses are at, but if you go to oxfordvacancies.com, uh, I'll have a slide. I think the last slide I'll hold up so you can write that down or, or we can put it in the chat, uh, oxfordvacancies.com. And you can filter houses by county and by gender to see where they're at. Okay, so as we look for houses and we want to expand, let's say we want to open a house in Montgomery County. So we would go into a, a nice neighborhood, probably avoid the gated communities with HO, really strict HOAs. We, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to turn over the entire apple cart, but we do want to move into nice areas. We want it to be a nice house. We want it close to public transportation if it's available. We want it close to job opportunities, to 12-step meetings. We want it close to maybe the grocery store because not everybody coming in has a car. Most of the time, only half the people have a car because they've lost it in their addiction or lost their license or their vehicle. But we want large homes, four, five, six bedroom homes. Sometimes we have to change a second living room or a formal dining room into a bedroom to make additional bed space. But we don't use bunk beds. We don't cram people. Again, we're not money motivated. We're not profit motivated. So we're about recovery. We want people to have their own space. So you will see a lot of doubles a lot of two person rooms, and then there's some singles too. So as people st stay around longer, they can move into those single rooms when they become available. And every once in a while, you'll see a three person room. Those are rare, but maybe a converted garage, it's huge. Or maybe there's a huge, like, I don't know, a den or something like a second living room upstairs that was a big common area we can sometimes close off and turn into a, a three person room. But the average number of beds in a house is eight, eight or nine. Uh, and we just, we want to have plenty of parking. We want to have multiple bathrooms. So there's plenty for that. And we want to make sure that uh, the house is, is in town. There's some really nice big homes on the outskirts of, of big cities, but 
again, without transportation that it's setting them up to fail. And that's not what we're interested in. And then the internal setup is you're going to walk in if you tour an Oxford house and hopefully now that COVID's kind of dying down, we can start doing some open houses in some of our communities, especially during recovery month, September's national recovery month. We try to do open houses, let the public come in and see the homes. What you'll see is that they're set up just like any other home. There may be an extra couch in the living room and there may be an extra refrigerator or two in the kitchen or dining room. And there's definitely, you know, more beds. We're using full twin or full size beds in the bedrooms so that people, we have space for people to share a room, but we're not turning a, a room uh, any smaller than 12 by 12 into a double. We're just not, it's going to be a single room. Um, one thing I've noticed that, that people say when they come into our houses, like, wow, this house is actually cleaner than my house. Well, we have weekly chores. So uh, yeah, we, we make sure that when you have multiple adults living in the home, the normal wear and tear and just use on everything is uh, exponential. So we wanna make sure we're coming in and, and keeping the house clean. So we're very, very particular about making that a big part of the weekly house meeting is, is everybody doing their, their chores. We have another question. Okay. It's regarding Montgomery County again. Uh, they don't have public transportation there. So would that prevent Oxford House from uh, having a house there? Absolutely not. If it never existed, then the people who live in that community don't know that they're missing it, if that makes sense. So if we opened a house in Austin, but we put it three miles from the bus stop, people coming into that house that maybe are used to taking the bus to work or to the store or wherever, would be very discouraged because they would have to walk three miles to get to the bus stop. But people in communities where there is no public transportation, there's, it, it really doesn't matter if we're not, you know, if we're in a certain area or not, we just want to look for um, maybe meetings, local meetings or employment or shopping uh, areas. That's what we want to stay close to. That's what we pay attention to. But we have plenty of houses in smaller communities that don't have a uh, consistent public transportation. Sometimes we'll buy a house bicycle or a, a house scooter or something and, and just have people check it out, you know, maybe right on the dry rice board that they're checking out the, the bicycle to go to a meeting or go to work. Okay, so in the community, it's very important that we become part of the community. We're battling stigma. Addiction is, there's still a stigma. It's getting better. People are becoming educated to see that it's not a moral dilemma, that it's a health crisis. And with the uh, opioid epidemic, I think people are finally starting to understand that people, it's not bad, it's not bad people trying to get good, it's sick people trying to get well. And addiction, a lot of times people associate with crime and they just won't separate the two. Well, we have to work extra hard in, in the house that we rent to, to not get the neighbors upset with this. We want to make sure the grass is mowed, that there's good landscaping. We try to, even though there may be some extra cars in front of the house, we wanna make sure that we're not hanging out in the front of the house, that if there are people that smoke or vape, that they're, you know, we're, they hang out in the back. Um, a lot of times they may turn the garage into like a common area where they may smoke, um, but we try to keep the noise level down. There's curfews in place. Like we, we really try to be good neighbors. We're really interested in that because we don't want to feed into the stigma of addiction. And then the cities we live in, we, want, we don't want to get on the radar of the city. Sometimes cities have ordinances where you can't have more than four unrelated people living together. And that's where our legal team will come in and they will educate the cities that you know, we are a protected class under the Federal Fair Housing Act and that we can live in this home as a single family. We were requesting reasonable accommodation to do so. And then we're also learning that there are many pathways to recovery. Early on in the 70s, when Oxford House first opened, it was AA and then NA came around, but it was 12 step based. And that was kind of the one pathway that most people found recovery. I mean, there was obviously different people found recovery in different ways, but primarily there was one highway and it was the 12 step community. Now we're finding that there are a lot of different pathways to recovery and we're having to adapt a little bit and recognize that we just want to see growth. We want to see growth in people. We want to see people be happy, joyous, and free and make good decisions and just grow as individuals, whatever that pathway looks like for them. We have a question. Okay. Are individuals who participate in MAT eligible for Oxford House? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're very supportive of MAT. In fact, in Texas, we have a training and education coordinator who's 
uh, her specific job is to not only educate on how to uh, recognize, uh, prevent, and, and possibly reverse an overdose with the use of Narcan, but also how MAT works in Oxford House. Um, I can get into that uh, in a little bit during the presentation to talk specifically about some of that uh, suboxone and methadone. Uh, there's many people in Oxford House that are either currently using it or have been prescribed it in the past. We do uh, very strict medication counts in houses. We want to make sure it's locked up so that other people aren't triggered by the medication. Uh, we, we, we would need doctor's notes if prescription changes, and we would also check behaviors. It's not about the medicine, it's about the behaviors. There are people that come in that will try to abuse the system when it comes to MAT, and they, they get called out pretty quickly in an Oxford house, because if you're abusing it, that means you're probably taking too much or you're selling it, so you don't have enough on you. And if people are nodding out or their slurred speech, their behavior indicates that the medication is not right, the house will investigate. Are they misusing their medication on purpose? Uh, to get high or to you know manipulate the system or is it that they're they have a new prescription or maybe the doctor changed their dose and they're adjusting to it or there can be a lot of different reasons but the houses are being taught to investigate that and check behaviors and to if they see something to address it that they need to communicate about it and talk openly about it and document it so that we can help people because some people they have not relapsed, but they may show signs or side effects that may indicate that they're under the influence. And we want them to go talk to their doctor. We're not gonna play doctor for them. We're not going to tell them they have to taper down or when they have to be off the medication, that's between them and their doctor. We are, we're just peers in recovery. We don't hold medication. We're not pharmacists. We, we don't do any of that. We can have you count your medicine in front of us and we can, we can pay attention to your behaviors to see if there's changes that may indicate you to go see your doctor or maybe leave the house if you're abusing the medication. So uh, we've, we've learned how to uh, live people that are, uh, are complete abstinent with no medication and, and the people that are using a medication assisted recovery program. And, and I remind the houses and the individual in the houses that, um, that there's that word assisted. So the medication is not the recovery. The medication is not the treatment. It assists in the treatment and recovery program. So they are doing, they should be doing extra things. They should be seeing a, a, a doctor, maybe part of a counseling group or program with a facility. So they are tied to some agency that is working with them. They're not just, if they're just getting medication, they're doing nothing else around it. That's not MAT. That's just taking medication. And so it's addressed very differently in the houses. But yes, very good question. We're very supportive of MAT. So, okay, an Oxford house, they're self-supporting. They're self-governed, you know, they're not always gonna make the best decisions, but they're also within a protective bubble. And in order to make sure that the houses are within the confines of the Oxford House model and traditions and still operating with integrity, we have trained outreach with lived experience. So in, in Texas, we have, I think it's 16 staff, many outreach workers spread out throughout the state that are opening houses and training members. So they can come in and handle quality control, conflict resolution, they're doing informal trainings, sitting in house meetings, helping people fill out forms or, you know, teach them how to use parliamentary procedure, you know, how to second a motion, how to record in the meeting minutes, how to change signers at the bank account, how to budget for going grocery shopping, you know, just how to check receipts, how to do a monthly audit of a checking account. So we know that all the money coming in went out matches what the bank statement says. So the outreach worker can help with that because the biggest problem that we have in Oxford House is that people come and go. So information gets lost in, in the transition of membership. So as outreach workers, we want to make sure that we are that institutional memory of the model of Oxford House. So we go in and we'll do formal trainings every few months where we actually rent out of uh, maybe a, a fellowship hall at the church and show PowerPoints on a screen to say, this is, how you are, this is how you do house president. This is how you do house secretary. This is how you open a new house. This is how you do a presentation at a treatment center to try to fill your beds. So we do all of that to give technical assistance. And then we're just, it's just a rinse and repeat. It's a rinse and repeat. We open a house, we fill it up, we train the members. Then we back away so that they can operate the home themselves. And we go open another house and fill it up and train the members. And then maybe we got to go back to the first house because they turned over 50% of their membership in the last year. And now the new people aren't quite being shown the same way that we showed them when we came to the house. So now we got to go in and, and work with them a little bit. So uh, any individual Oxford house outreach worker can 
uh, safely work with about 30 houses in a metro area, 30, 40 houses. Um, because the houses are set up to operate on their own, there's no need for the outreach to be involved in every little aspect of every interview, every acceptance, every um, behavior contract, every emergency meeting. They don't just, the houses get to do that on their own. And we train the chapters, which is the, the collection of houses to use peer support to help each other too, because we do have people that stick around years in Oxford House. Nobody's asked to leave uh, until they're ready. As long as you're paying your fair share, you're clean and sober, you're not disruptive, you can stay as long as you want in Oxford houses. We have a, an individual in San Antonio who's lived in Oxford house for 15 years now. And it's just home. That's his home. Nobody's, nobody's going to ask him to leave. We enjoy having his experience, strength, and hope at the chapter meetings. Uh, we also want to do community outreach and recovery support services. So a lot of the staff are getting involved in peer recovery support specialist training. Uh, we want to get into any of the community stuff that's going on with other agencies. We want to refer to outside professionals. If somebody needs counseling, maybe they're going through a tough time. Maybe they have co-occurring mental health disorders that they're dealing with. Like we're not, the houses are not set up for that. We're set up to provide a safe, sober environment. And that's, and that's it, peer support. But if they need professional help, then we refer them to professionals in the community. So we wanna make sure we're building those relationships and building those bridges so we can give warm handoffs to the people that do have the expertise to work with individuals on that. And then uh, we get money from block grant, uh, pass through money from the substance abuse block grant from SAMHSA. And then we have some money from some of the SOR funding in different states. In Texas, it's, it's strictly from the block grant, but that money doesn't go to pay for the houses. It pays for the, the, the outreach staff, the technical assistance to expand and maintain the network of Oxford houses. Right now in Texas, there's 280, I think 280 houses. Uh, and there's a lot, a lot of, um, people coming and going in Oxford House at any given time. Okay, so now we can get specifically into the women with children. Uh, location. I, I talked about this earlier, how we want to open nice houses and nice neighborhoods. Well, when we're looking for a women and children's house, this is even more important. We do not want to put a women and children's house on a busy road, on a through road or a road that has maybe a high speed limit. We do not want to put uh, an Oxford house in an area where um, maybe there's uh, no playgrounds or parks or anything nearby. Like we try to look for areas that are going to be supportive of having uh, children in the home. Uh, we try to avoid houses that have pools or stairs just because of the risk, the liability risk and the safety risk of the children. We just, we're you got to remember, there's no management in the houses. There's nobody that's that's uh, taking charge in this. They're doing it collectively. So we just want to minimize any risk to the safety of of any member in the house, whether they're adult or child. Um, the bedrooms we want multiple bedrooms, large houses. We need very large houses. We definitely want second living rooms or play areas that are not converted into bedrooms that can stay as play areas. That's important. So because the the way that the houses are set up for women and children is it's not like seven bedrooms, let's say 10 uh, beds where you have a, a parent for each bed. We have one or two single rooms, maybe three single rooms, depending on how it's set up. The single rooms in the house are usually the women with children's rooms and the mother that comes into that house can bring their children up to two. We just don't have space to put three children in one bedroom. There's fire safety codes we, have to, we do have to pay attention to and just common sense. We also want the children to be under the age of 12 when they come in for a couple of reasons. Number one is for space. We just, we don't have it set up for that. And number two is when, you, when children, whether female or male start to get into puberty or start to become teenagers, then there can be problems within the house such, such as, they start to experiment with drugs and alcohol. Um, a lot of times the children that are coming into these environments have um, not had maybe the most consistent childhood uh, for whatever reason. So them coming in, sometimes there's behavioral problems that uh, the parents and the child are working on together. The parents learning how to be a parent again. The child's learning how to respect their parent. They're learning how to communicate together. And when you get into teenage years, that is sometimes um, compounded with just going through that stage in life. So we try to keep the children smaller, under, under 12. And they do have to pay a little bit extra. So if everybody's paying 120 a week to live in the home, 
the parent will have to pay an extra anywhere from 10 to $25 per week per child because there is added uh, use on the home, on the utilities, on the, on the water and the, the supplies. So there is a little bit higher cost. Um, we, if there are young children, uh, toddlers, we wanna pay attention to childproofing the home. So, you know, baby gates to maybe stay out of the kitchen areas or, or putting the little stoppers in the plugs or just making sure that the other women in the house know that not to leave, you know, anything out that may harm a child. But we want to respect that even though there are women and children in the home, that there are just women that don't have children in the home too. Uh, so they have other parts of the house and they need to feel like it's their home too, that they're not staying at a nursery or a daycare. So we do limit homes to maybe no more than three, sometimes four children in the home, depending on their ages and the, and the space. Each home's going to be different. They're all set up different. The women in the house decide on on the guidelines and, and we try to structure it to where it's, it's just, it works for everybody. We just try to use good communication and common sense for that. But most of the home is, are gonna be women that don't have full-time custody of their children in the house. Um, so on weekends, it can, it can get a little crazy in an auction house because you do have women that maybe they don't have custody, but they're, they have weekend visitation. So they may have their two or three kids coming to stay the night because you do get, you get overnights. I mean, it's a, it's an auction, in an auction house, the first 30 days, you're not gonna, be able to stay out overnight or have any guests come in just to get used to the structure of Oxford House. But after that, they'll get two or three nights a week where they can have guests come over or um, they can stay out. Now, in a women and children's houses, we don't allow any uh, significant others to stay the night. And there's absolutely no sexual activity allowed in a women and children's Oxford House or men and children's Oxford House. It's just, it's, we can't allow that to happen. That's, that raises too much risk. Uh, so we do have some very more strict guidelines. Now I say all of this, this is all, if you read the Oxford House Manual, you're not gonna find anything about women in children's house, except to mention that we do have women in children's houses. So a lot of this is kind of best practices that has developed over the last 25 years that we've been opening women in children's houses across the country. So we have like a set of parent guidelines that's in addition to the house rules that most houses have in place. We also put in place a uh, basically a understanding that the parent will sign that if for any reason they return to drug use or become violent in any way that the house has a, a duty to notify authorities. So we're not going to allow you being intoxicated to leave with your two young children um, because you're expelled from the house. We're going to call um, your counselor. We're going to call a caseworker. We're going to call uh, protective services, whoever we need to call to protect the children. So we do have them sign that. Um, well, again, I got ahead of myself here. Um, so the parent agreement, um, I can provide a copy of that. And, and just, just to preface, this is not, it's not an Oxford House Incorporated policy. Oxford House Incorporated has very few policies. We, we issue charters to houses and then we wanna train for technical and give technical assistance. The houses, really they run themselves. So you may walk into a women and children's house and see that, it looks very different from another women and children's house. It's just a, across town uh, because just the culture is different. The number of children in the home is a little bit different. The, the age range is different. So they set up these house rules and guidelines in place to help protect uh, the, the women in the home and the children. There's an added protection for the children too. And it's, it's adaptive. So at one time you may have one child that's three years old that everybody loves and she's a quiet, quiet kid and, and gets along with everybody. And then you have um, maybe an eight-year-old and a six-year-old that come in with the next member and they're just little hellions and they just don't listen to mom. They get in yelling matches. They leave their toys out all over and it just, it becomes disruptive. And so the house has to sit down and have a talk and maybe even put the mother on a contract to say, you know, you, if you're going to continue to live in this house, that your relationship with your children is, is disruptive. You need to take some parenting classes or we're going to connect with an outside agency so that you can try to get some help with this. Like there, something needs to happen here and we, we can't allow this to continue to take place and not do something about it. So we're putting you on a contract to go get some professional help. Um, and then you'll have just wonderful parties. I mean, there may be a birthday party where one child is living in the home and then the others are visiting their, their mothers 
on the weekends and you have eight kids over there and everybody's eating cake and outside playing and, you know, having a good time, watching, watching, you know, Nickelodeon, or whatever on the TV. And it's just, it's just a really, really supportive environment. So it's a wide range. I mean, in early recovery, we, like I said, we cast a pretty wide net. We, you know, we, we can't catch everybody, but we cast a pretty wide net. So we're getting people that are coming in with very little parenting experience. We get some that, you know, have lots of parenting experience. We have some that uh, co-occurring mental health. We have some that uh, need very, very acute care and some that are self-supporting and they just don't really need much help at all. So we try to adapt and we try to just teach the model of Oxford House and try to stick to recovery principles. And that usually gets us through when and if we need any additional help, that's where our partnerships in the community come into play to help. Um, but we do have accountability. We, we're we're going to check your attitudes and be your behaviors. You cannot use your kids as a, as a crutch as to why you can't go out and get employment and not pay your fair share. I understand that you have your kids back and it's a, it's a struggle and you're trying to balance everything, but you still have to have some sort of income so that you can pay to live here. We can't allow you to get behind just because you're trying to figure out your schedule or reconnect with your children. Um, and then behaviors, you know, the, the yelling, the back and forth, or maybe you're not being responsible enough to get a babysitter or daycare during the summer months when school's out. And so you ask your housemate to babysit while you go to work. Like, that's not okay. We don't use, we teach them not to use each other as babysitters, as crutches, because that's not the other girls in the house's responsibility to take care of your children. So we try to teach that. Um, but we also, we try to stick to warnings and contracts. So nothing is like we don't expect perfection in Oxford House. We teach that people are growing, people are coming in. Oxford House probably isn't the first choice for most people coming in. I mean, I've taught, I, I, I ask this all the time when I'm giving workshops and then maybe there's a hundred Oxford House members in the room. I'm like, how many of you want to live in Oxford House the rest of your life? I've yet to see anybody raise their hand that Oxford House is where they want to end up. And it's, it's, a, it's just a chapter in their life. It's, it's just a moment in time for them that hopefully they can get their life together, get a good foundation of, of what they want to do, where they want to be career-wise, education-wise, family-wise, and they can move on into independent living and never have to look back and never have to worry about active addiction again, that they can live clean and sober life and be successful in whatever they pursue. And Oxford House can, can catapult somebody into that. It's what a lot of people need before independent living because they're just not quite ready for that and the environment they came from is not supportive at all. So this is a supportive environment, but it's just a moment in time for them. And, and people come in at very, very different levels of understanding, whether it's social interaction or just education or age or their life experiences. So we need to understand that we got to meet people where they're at is really what it's about. We got to meet people where they're at, but we can't allow negative behavior to become a pattern. So when negative behavior, uh, occurs they address it and they'll talk about it either one-on-one -on -one or as a house and they'll say you know you can't do that you can't if you're going to cook for your kids you got to clean up after yourself you can't leave a mess in the kitchen for somebody else who just worked eight hours to come home to and have to clean up like that's not okay and if they continue to do it then eventually it may cost them their membership so they address it they may put them on a contract where they just document it to say hey this is the behavior we see that needs change this is what we want you to do to change it and this is how much time you got to do it. And if they can't meet that contract, then they're basically saying to the house that we don't want to live here anymore. And so we, they, they will expel them. Uh, we do, uh, like I said, we want to make outside referrals. So if whatever the behavior is, is something that is beyond the scope of just living in an Oxford house and being respectful to your fellow housemates, then we will refer to outside professionals. And then finally, here's the resources. Uh, Oxfordhouse.org is our national website. Uh, I posted in the chat. Uh, we have a vacancy site. So if you're looking to refer a client to an Oxford house or you know of somebody who would benefit from living in Oxford house, they can find a house that has uh, vacancies. Uh, and it's kind of a cool site. How it's set up is on this site, there's the house name and number, and you can click on the house to see where it's at on the map. Uh, you can filter by county, by gender, by number of openings, by state. You can really narrow it down to what you're looking for. And uh, the, the system will text a member of the house each week and ask how many vacancies you have. And they just respond with a number, two. We have two vacancies and it'll update the system. So 
you can see when it was last updated, most of the houses in Texas, they do a really good job of updating every week whenever they have membership changes. So it's, it's almost, you know, it's a virtually real time numbers on vacancies. And then if the house phone, if they don't answer the house phone, which has been a problem since the invention of cell phones, everybody's got a cell phone, so they don't think they got to answer the house phone. We do include a contact person and cell phone number on the vacancy site. So I would strongly encourage you to call the contact person as well. They can help set up an interview for the individual um, face to face or a phone interview. If, if somebody's in a facility or, or institution where they cannot get out to go to a face to face interview, we can do interviews over the phone. And then there it finally is my contact information. Um, I welcome anybody who wants to call and chat about Oxford House. Uh, I'm open to and, I, and we have staff around the state of Texas that are now open to doing presentations on Zoom or in-person presentations. All of our staff are fully vaccinated, but we're very eager to get back out into the community and start doing presentations. We like to do uh, maybe staff presenta presentations first if we have never been to an agency or facility, just so we can educate the staff because they're interacting with their clients uh, or patients more often. Um, but we eventually want to, especially if it's a treatment, inpatient treatment center, we want to get in and do reoccurring every 30 days, come in at like every Tuesday at three o'clock, come in and do a presentation to all the clients so that we can share our experience. Everybody that works for Oxford House has lived in an Oxford House. So we're all lived experience in recovery in Oxford House, just trying to pay it forward. And uh, so I hope, I know that was a lot about Oxford House and a little bit about women and children, but I wanted you all to understand just kind of how Oxford House works. Uh, with the women and children, especially because um, we're not just a house full of women and children. We're just not set up for that. We, that, would be, um, that would not be good for individual recovery or, or the success of the house. So we try to open as many women and children's houses as we can across the state. I know that there's a huge need for a lot more and we're doing everything we can to do that. Uh, recently, the housing market has really created some challenges for us to be able to rent houses. We've had some of our houses especially in some other states where they, we've been renting them for 20 years. And now the homeowners are like, wow, my house is worth like three times what it was 20 years ago. I'm going to sell it. So they do not renew a lease with us. Or we find a house that is for sale um, that we have maybe a landlord that's going to purchase it specifically to rent to us because we like the quality of the house, um, but it's only on the market for like half a day and there's 40 offers on it. And so it, it becomes... They, it, it prices out of what we're able to do with it. So um, we're trying to open more houses across the state. I think what you're going to see over the next fiscal year in Texas is some large expansion. We're trying to get out to more of the rural areas and, and of course, continue to expand in the metro areas. We need 600 houses, at least 600 Oxford houses in Texas. Right now we have 275. So we still have a lot of work to do, especially with women and women with children. So um, I will open it up for any more questions or any more comments. Uh, we still have a little bit of time, but um, if there's, you know, once we're done with questions and comments, I'm okay with, with closing this out early. I'm done with my presentation. So thank you all. Uh, we have a, a few questions here. Uh, okay. Let's see, are group meetings provided in the houses? Um, like uh, counseling? Group counseling. The person that asked that, would you like to expand on that? Like clinical groups. Well, no, we're more oh. like peer support, peer to peer support groups. We uh, we do allow houses to have recovery meetings. They they we don't want to call it AA or NA. They can do recovery peer groups and read from literature. Uh, we have a lot of members in houses that are strongly encouraged to get recovery coaches. So recovery coaches will sometimes come over. Uh, we don't, the only kind of group meetings that we do have inside the home are usually just the membership meetings, the weekly business meetings or emergency meetings. We try to refer people out into the community. We don't want to turn the home into a institutional setting or clinical setting. We want it to feel like a home and not a facility. So we try to uh, keep a lot of the uh, professional groups or the uh, agency uh, tied groups to on their property or neutral locations. Next question. Do you work with judicial referrals? Oh, absolutely. We are working very hard 
with our reentry, um, we have <clears throat> individuals that have come directly from prison, from parole or direct release that are coming in. We have people that are being referred from uh, probation and parole. We have people being referred from community sentencing, pre-release. We have people being referred from drug court. So we're trying all the different uh, avenues of uh, the criminal justice system are important for us to connect with because what we find in Oxford House is people that are coming in have gotten stuck in two different hamster wheels. So they've gotten stuck in the detox treatment hamster wheel where they've gone to treatment multiple times. Most people coming in Oxford House have been to treatment at least three times. So they keep going back, keep going back, but they, they end up in the same environment and then they start using again and then they're back in treatment or they get into some trouble and they end up in the criminal justice system. And now they're cycling through that, through jails, drug courts, or even prison. So they get caught in one of those hamster wheels and it's hard to get out of those. When they come into an Oxford house, we're seeing that cycle break. So we are trying to work very closely with all the uh, judges, uh, probation officers, case managers, uh, reentry coordinators in all of the different institutions throughout criminal justice to, to help with that. Now, we don't have a policy nationally to say that somebody does not qualify to move into an auction house, but I will tell you that a house, just about every house will deny anybody who's a sex offender and they will deny anybody who has uh, convictions of arson. So we don't want any sex offenders in our house. Most of our houses are near parks or schools, so they don't, it would be illegal for them to live there anyway. But houses just aren't set up to deal with that. We don't need the pressure from the community. So somebody else can, can handle the housing of sex offenders. It's, we're just not a good fit for that. And then arsonists for obvious reasons. If they leave disgruntled, we don't, don't want to be worried that they might try to come back and set the house on fire. Okay, next question is, uh, how does an individual become a case manager for Oxford? Do they have to be a client or former tenant of Oxford? So our outreach workers are all former members of Oxford House that got involved in service. They stepped up to be leaders in their houses. We don't have bosses, we have leaders. And then they probably got involved on the chapter level. So they got elected by the other houses to be maybe the chapter chair and show general leadership within the community. Maybe even got involved in attending our conventions or helping to plan workshops or do fundraisers or do presentations. So in order for Oxford House to be successful in the community, it requires members in the houses to step outside of themselves and be of service to the, to the organization as a whole and to just pay it forward to help keep the beds full and keep them strong. So as people continue to do that, then when positions come open where we have contracts with different states, we will interview those people that are interested in being full-time outreach workers. But every single outreach worker has given at least six months to a year in an auction house. Most have given many, many years of service work and volunteer work before they get hired. They need to know how to work, how the model of auction house works and how to go into a house and be able to teach brand new people how to live in this house democratically, self-supporting with zero tolerance. Next question. Do you collaborate with treatment community centers to obtain members? Also, is there a house for teens? We do collaborate with treatment and community centers. Um, we, wanna, we wanna collaborate with everybody. We, are, we wanna be part of the community, not just the recovery community, the entire community. We wanna partner with faith-based. A lot of people are struggling with drug addiction. They, they're not going to treatment, they're going to their pastor. They're, they're talking to their, their preacher. Uh, we, wanna, we want to get involved with EMS. We want to, you know, the first responders sometimes are the ones responding to an overdose uh, and having to Narcan somebody that needs help. We want uh, to talk to the police. We want to talk to city officials. We want to promote uh, recovery supportive uh, legislation that gives us the ability to have a hand up when we're in early recovery, we, we wanna to talk to everybody and we wanna partner with everybody. We even wanna to talk to other sober livings. We're not, because we're not mo motivated by money, we want to partner with other sober livings because people that are in a more structured sober living may be ready for Oxford House after their stay at that facility. They may wanna to come to us before they move out on their own. Or we may have somebody that applies and gets accepted into our Oxford House but we find out that they need more structure. They're not ready to be self-supporting. They're not ready to take on the responsibilities and the freedoms that are in an auction house. They need some direct care and support. And so we can refer to a more structured sober living environment. So 
we understand that we're just one little part of the community that we do housing. And that's all we want to do housing and peer support within that house and, and everything else we want to be partnered with so that we don't have to try to change who we are. And uh, house for teens, no, unfortunately, we don't have any house for teens. It have to be at least 18 uh, to move into an office. We can do 17 with a uh, release of liability from a uh, parent or guardian, but that's as young as we will go. What about methadone members? Are they allowed? Yeah, absolutely. As I said before, MAT is, is supported Suboxone, Methadone, uh, Vivitrol. We, we support all uh, pathways of recovery, including medication-assisted recovery. Uh, we train the houses to uh, be supportive of that. There is a stigma within the recovery community that that's a crutch and that you're not in recovery if you're on methadone. And I'll be honest with you, as, as uh, people transition in, in and out of Oxford houses, you may have people coming into Oxford House with that mentality. So we, we're constantly having to train that this is, this is a pathway of recovery. And even though you don't agree with it, it, this may be working for them. And if it's working for them, then we celebrate it and we support it. And that's, that's, the, that's just the basic facts. If it's working for them and they're doing it in accordance with their physician and their counselor, they're doing what they're supposed to do, we're going to celebrate and support them. I don't, it doesn't matter what your opinion is of, of what somebody else should do. What, what I do for my recovery is very different from what in the Oxford house, what somebody down the hallway in the next bedroom over does for their recovery. It may look very different, but we're both in recovery. And can you just talk about how long they get to stay in the house? As long as they want. Um, we've had members stay 20 plus years. We've had, they called him Pops. He retired in an Oxford house, didn't have any family left. Um, he stayed until the house could no longer take care of him. He was in significant pain. Uh, I think he went through cancer and had to be placed on some very, very strong narcotic medication. So they helped him transition into an assisted living center. But we, as long as you want, you pay your fair share, you're not disruptive, you stay clean and sober, you stay as long as you want to an auction house. When we fill a house, we'll open another one. That's, that's our philosophy. We're not going to kick somebody out before they're ready just to make room for a new person. Uh, but you will be held accountable to your actions and behaviors. So the average length of stay is about a year. Nine months to a year is about the average length of stay for an individual. But we, we ask people to, to try to stick around at least a year, get through that early recovery. And so you can get to know who you are, find out what kind of person you are, get solid in your recovery before you decide to move out because the stresses of life and living on your own, they will eat you alive. You think just because you're, you got your family back and a few material possessions back after four months that you're ready to go tackle the world, just don't rush. The world will be there. It will be waiting for you. Let's get your everything in order here. Do you want a, a, a good job? Do you, you want to get back in school? Do you want to save, put some money away? Like, let's really look at your future here before you just decide to jump out and, and move out because uh, you've gotten a few things come back in your life. So we try to encourage people to stick around. That was the last question. All right. Oh, we have another one. Ha <laughs> ha. Do you interview members that have similar addictions in the same house? Absolutely. Uh, a melting pot works best. Different ages, different races, uh, different life experiences, socioeconomic backgrounds. When, when I see a mix of people in a house that can share from different perspectives on life, those are the houses that kind of gel the best. I have witnessed uh, some houses that are young adults, the 18 to 25, where they're all together all these guys live together and it turns into a bachelor pad and they're more interested in chasing the girls at the local AA meeting than they are maybe focusing on their recovery. So that's one of the houses that I'm probably constantly visiting, trying to encourage them to make better decisions. So it's best if we have a mix, but you'll see common uh, drugs of choice come into the house. What the only thing that we're careful of is let's say that somebody had a history of abusing Suboxone or abusing uh, maybe a sleep aid medication. And somebody comes in with that medication, we're not gonna ask that person to witness a pill count. Like I'm not, or a, or a medication count. I'm not gonna ask somebody who had, ha who had, had previously been abusing Suboxone to sit and watch somebody else count their Suboxone in front of the house. Like that's just not fair to them. So we, we do try to pay attention to triggers and what's comfortable for, for each other, but um, common drugs of choice does not uh, exclude anybody. Anybody's eligible to interview at any house, provided you're of the same gender. And then uh, a question that, that would come up 
when I say that is uh, gender identity. So uh, however you identify. So we do have transgender uh, persons in, in our houses and it's just what, how do you identify? Do you identify as male or female? That would be the, the gender of house that you would interview at. All right, let's see. Does a nurse visit the house regularly? Nope, it's just a home. Uh, if I would say if you rent a home with your family, um, you would not have, uh, a, well, I mean, I mean, so I guess COVID, sometimes we do have nurses visiting the houses now, but we don't, we refer to outside. If somebody needs to have uh, regular visits with their doctor, we try to get them to go to the facility. Uh, same with like recovery coaches or counselors. We try to get them to go to the agency so that again, the home feels like a home and not a facility. Next question. How many children can a mother bring into a mommy and me house? Depends on the size of the house. Most houses are not set up for a mother to bring in more than two children, uh, especially if they're older. Uh, so I've seen a room, a, a large single room where they have like an eight and a six year old. And that's, that's a lot. That's putting a lot in one room, especially because you want the kids to have their own space too. You don't want them to feel like they're kind of got this little bitty corner and they can't even have their toys or, you know, they don't have any dresser space. So we try to limit it to maybe two to three children per home and one child per bedroom or two children per bedroom, depending on size. But the space of the home really plays in a factor for that. Next question, ever considered married couples or significant other home? No, it, you lose focus on recovery when you have um, in-house relationships. We have a hard enough time just trying to keep the men out of the women's houses visiting and hanging out and vice versa. Because, you know, it's just, they're kind of a tribe, right? Oxford houses, we get together as chapters, we get together and do unity events and fundraisers. So they see each other a lot. The men's and women's houses do interact but they end up dating each other and they end up hanging out at each other's houses and just, just them hanging out at each other's houses can sometimes cause conflict. So we don't even want to try to get into the married or, you know, the couples. We just, we're, we're not set up for that. That would be a, a home that would need some sort of in-house management and that would go against our model. Great All questions right. though. Any more questions? No, I think it's, I think everybody's gotten all some good information. Great. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. And thank you, Jackson. We really appreciate it. I know I learned a lot um, and uh, I will, uh, the PowerPoint's already shared in your Canvas account. So if you need to reference any of that information, uh, just log into your Canvas account under uh, PowerPoint presentation. And uh, everybody have a wonderful and safe day.